On the 10th of April, Dr Hilary Cass, a former president of Britain's Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, released the final report of her independent review of gender identity services for children and young people. The 388-page report is the result of four years of work by Dr Cass and her research team at the University of York, who made headlines all around the world for its scathing assessment of the practice of dishing out puberty blockers to gender-questioning children despite there being no evidence to justify this, and its warnings over the dangers of a gender-affirming and social transitioning approach more generally. The Christian Institute has been campaigning on the principle that you can't change sex since before the Gender Recognition Act came in in 2004. And we recognise that this is a significant milestone in that campaign. Now that the media hubbub has died down, it's a good time to take a step back and reflect on the CAS report and its impact. With me to do that online is the founder and director of parent group Transgender Trend, Stephanie Davis Arai, and in the studio, the paediatrician, Dr. Julie Maxwell, and the Institute's head of education, John Denning. Welcome to all of you, thank you. It'd probably be a good thing if we just started by reminding ourselves of some of the key findings of that report. It said there was no evidence to uh, justify an approach and mindset practices that have been highly politicized, but nevertheless used for years. It said that the evidence for prescribing puberty blockers and hormone treatments to under 18s with gender distress was remarkably weak. In fact, that the entirety of gender medicine for young people is built on shaky foundations. It gives cautions over uh, these drugs being used by anyone up to the age of 25. It said there was no evidence that they buy time to think, rather that they're likely to lead on to cross-sex hormones. No evidence they reduce suicide risk, that trump card that activists have been using for years. But it did suggest that there was evidence of ideology displacing biology. Dr. Maxwell, if we could start with you, landmark is often an overused term but it does seem justified in the case of this report. I, I think it is and it isn't. Um, you know, I think the review confirms what many of us have known or at least suspected for a very long time. So Stephanie and I, amongst others, have been saying exactly the things that are in the CAS review for, for many years. So from that regard, it's not landmark. Um, but and, and from the perspective that we shouldn't have ever got to this point. But actually, given the situation that we have got to and the fact that anyone who spoke up for such a long time would be silenced, vilified, yeah. um, uh, There was a whole attacked. counterculture around there it. There was a whole there? counterculture. So, it, it, so I think for those of us who've, who've lived through that for the last few years, I think it is, it is landmark in that to have this 388 page document that confirms the things we've been saying all along, I think is, is really important. I mean, I, I attended a training back at Tavistock in 2017, and a lot of these things were mentioned, um, and yet they were still doing it. Mm. Um, so to have it really clear that the rise in, in particularly in teenage girls and the lack of evidence um, in black and white uh, is, is, is landmark, as you yeah. say. I mean, in, just in that intro, I was saying no evidence, no evidence, no evidence. I mean, if you were to take away sort of two words from the CAS review as a summary, no evidence yeah. seems to be the recurring theme, doesn't it? And, and as a paediatrician, I think that's what kind of got me so interested in this and, and it was the fact that compared to everything else I did in paediatrics, that the approach was so different and the lack of evidence, uh, that, that was what shocked me and, and made me think, I need to look at this more. Good, well, I'm going to come back to going to come back to that in just a little bit. Stephanie uh, Davis Zarai, you've been calling for evidence-based health care uh, for gender questioning children since 2015, if not before. You must be pleased. Yes, I'm very pleased. I read it through. Well, it took me all day. I read it through very carefully. And yeah, at the end of it, I, I thought, oh, okay, can I stop now? Um, <laughs> It, you know, it, it's not, uh, you know, you're saying it's it, it's not perfect. There are areas that people have raised say, some issues of language. What comes across really strongly to me um, is that I think when Cass was writing that report, the group of children that were at the forefront of her mind, I, I'm, I'm speculating here, are the children who've been affirmed, who are already on blockers, who... And they are the real um, 
say, collateral damage in this, that it's not the, it's not the fault of the CAS report, um, as some activists are saying, that it, it was called a social murder charter in, in Scotland, with um, some group. Um, and people are, you know, activists are sort of blaming the CAS report for um, harming trans kids. It's not the CAS report. It's the fact that these children have been lied to for so long. They've been promised a magic cure for um, a diagnosis that has been handed down by adults um, an from an ideological viewpoint. They've been told, or they've certainly been given a strong message that unless they can have, unless they're affirmed and they can have um, medical intervention, they're more likely to take their own lives. So it really is transition or die has been the message from for, for children. And also the message that anybody who doesn't affirm you um, and support you on this pathway, the only possible reason they could do that is because they're a transphobic bigot. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So these children have, have been brought up to feel that they're victimised, to feel disempowered um, and to feel that everybody hates them and that they are uniquely vulnerable. And I think when you're looking at how you treat children, there are forms of emotional abuse and I think that falls into that category to give children that message so strongly. And that message is not only coming from or hasn't only been coming from trans lobby groups but it's been coming from schools it's been coming from the bbc it's been coming you know from wider society um children are picking up that message all the time so to have this report that actually very calmly lays down the evidence for the gender affirming pro approach generally is a huge breath of fresh air it's reading about the reality of the situation rather than reading anything that's ideological. Um, and so, it, and, and almost, um, yeah, it, it, it takes us back to what normal healthcare looks like. And one of the things I wanted to ask you was um, you've, you've called for a, a, a purge of gender ideology from, from the NHS uh, recently. Um, I know it's early days. Um, do you see any signs of of that um, change of direction taking shape off off the back of uh, the uh, back of all the headlines that Cass generated? Yes, I do. But I also know that it's so embedded throughout the NHS that it's going to. You know, I think it's going to be another one of those one step forward, two steps back. There are always new initiatives. Um, the NHS has stopped funding the um, Rainbow Badge Scheme, but there's, the, the principles of that, or, uh, behind that, are still so firmly embedded. You know, you have pride displays and celebrations in children's hospitals. You get posters up in GP surgeries. It, um, you know, staff wearing rainbow lanyards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and the the regional NHS trusts. Are so seem to be, or some of them are so completely captured. They've worked with together with lobby groups. So there are many, many activists within working within the NHS now, and to root them out or to um, change the rules, we have to really look at lots of areas. You know, equality, diversity, and inclusion initiatives have done an awful lot of damage. And the whole message from the NHS, as as the message that the same is the same message as children are receiving ev everywhere. You know, you have a gender identity, that's your authentic self, and nobody must deny that. So it's it's the same messaging that's coming from the NHS. So it is. I think it is going to take time, but I also think that. From what we've seen of NHS England and their response to the CAS review, it's been immediate, it's been quick, and um, they're putting in the changes or, or, or some really key changes immediately. They're taking it very, very seriously because it's so clear from the report that this is a service mm. that has completely failed children and failed to safeguard children. 
I mean, I think one of the things which has struck me from it is it's a very good start, mm. but it but it is only a start. But we've been we've been sort of talking perhaps a little um, removed from from the front line, um, Dr. Maxwell, and you do work on the front line as as a paediatrician. So, what what impact do you see that that CAS may have, and and have you started to see or sense? any sort of change. Again, I appreciate it's very early days. Yeah, up until now, most children with gender dysphoria would often bypass our service. They would often go straight to the gender identity service. So we tend to come across children for other reasons. So, you know, being admitted acutely or with self-harm or, or those kind of things. Um, but I think my experience has been that most of my colleagues have been very uncomfortable about the, the approach that's been taken. So when they've realised um, what was being done at the Tavistock uh, and that children weren't just being given counselling, um, that they were being sent down a medical pathway, most paediatricians were very comfortable with it, but were afraid to say anything. So they were afraid to speak so out. So uncom uncomfortable. Uncomfortable, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they were afraid to speak out. They, they wouldn't, because um, they, they'd be afraid of getting a complaint, um, you know, or being referred to the GMC um, and uh, so they wouldn't do that and I, and I feel that the CAS review now gives them the courage mm -hmm. uh, so the evidence that is clear and has been you know published by uh, you know by, by the government um, it, it gives them that uh, confidence to, to speak out um, I mean, personally, I've been quite disappointed by the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. Um, they spoke out in December against the Department for Education guidance on gender questioning children and um, said that they thought it was uh, potentially dangerous. Um, and they've made very little comment on the CAS review so far. I mean, I, I just just one one um, quote from, from what they did say. Children should be given the opportunity to express what matters to them and that this is taken into account by healthcare practitioners. This includes the use of pronouns and gender, gender identifiers in line with the child's wishes. And you know, as paediatricians, yes, we should care about what children think and how children feel, but we're not there just to go with their wishes. We're there to look at the long-term well, well-being yeah. of a child and from an evidence base. And, and at the moment, the Royal College of Paediatrics isn't quite there yet, I don't think. That's the whole affirmation model, which whole, Cass is trying to move it, us away exactly. from. Exactly. So, so while the you know paediatricians will be significantly affected by the restrictions put on prescribing, um, so that you know, so they won't any longer be expected to be involved in prescribing um, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and things like that. Um, I think. Uh, you know, it, it, there is a bit of a way to go in uh, in completely enabling paediatricians to leave behind the gender affirming model completely. Um, and I think as well, as paediatricians, the other thing we're going to have to deal with is exactly what Stephanie was mentioning, is the young people who've been told this is the answer um, mm. and are now having that taken away from them. And, and also the clinicians who've who've tra treated children because they genuinely thought it was the right thing to do. They genuinely had been told it was the evidence base mm -hmm. and, and, and now they're being told actually you've done the wrong thing. So I think those are things that we're going to have to deal with going forward. And uh, uh, Stephanie Davis and I picked up on the fact that NHS England had have responded quite quickly. Um, I think it's probably just worth sort of noting among ourselves that uh, um, the Sandyford Clinic in, uh, in Scotland has paused puberty blockers in the light of the review, and there's a, there's a whole debate going on in Scotland, um, which Dr. Cass has been uh, giving evidence to in terms of how Scotland deals with this. We also know that the Republic of Ireland, which has been sending uh, uh, children over to the Tavistock before it closed, for goodness knows how many years, um, is looking with interest um, as well. So there is there is certainly a wider impact. I think one of the really important things is what's happening with the adult clinics in the um, follow-on pathway for 17 to 25 year olds because at the mo you know that brings it into line with other mental health services where it's recognized that that that, that age group um, the brain is still developing you can't just jump from at age 17 into the adult services so that's really positive but the other issue is um from that, the NHS have promised to do a cast style review of the adult clinics. And that's absolutely critical 
because these young people were finding that the um, majority of referrals, why the waiting list is so long, is because around 85% um, of referrals to adult clinics are the late teens, young adult age group, and 75% of them are girls, and they have the same um, complex issues as the teenagers do at the, at the Tavistock. And yet in the adult clinics at the moment, there is just a simple affirmation and informed consent model. And you, you can get your hormones and even referred on for surgery after two appointments. So that really, really, that, that age group, I think, has fallen through the gaps and has been really put at risk. And that age group is very vulnerable. They're becoming adults, finding their way in the world, away from parents. And so... W- that, that age group does need protection as well. I know a lot of the focus has been on puberty blockers at the other end of, uh, of the scale, but, but, but that group of young adults also need support. So I'm really happy that that is a result of the, of the CAS final report. Yeah, you're quite right. Thank you. That's gonna, CAS is, does put a break on that, doesn't it? Yeah, and I, and I think a lot, a lot of parents particularly are very worried because you know, up until kind of 16, they can you, <clears throat> very often um, prevent their children from going down this route. And then all of a sudden they hit 17, they get shifted off the huge uh, waiting list of the Tavistock into adult services. And all of a sudden the parents have got no um, no say in what happens to the young people. Uh, you know, and, and you know, we know they're not, their brains aren't, their executive function is not fully formed till around about 25. So we should be treating that, that kind of age group differently to 30, 40 year olds, definitely. Thank you. Well, John, if I could turn to you, um, head of education, and and CAS doesn't really speak to that directly. I mean, it's seismic in its impact on on gender medicine, um, but un, as as has already come out, underlying the the medicine is the gender ideology, as this affirmation uh, idea, and that same ideology, as we all know, is at work in schools. What do you think the CAS review does for education? I think it's significant. I mean, as you say, it was never going to say a lot directly about education. Um, but the very fact that it it undermines this approach of automatic affirmation, that it says, you know, that this approach was adopted in the field of medicine completely, un, you know, sort of uncritically on the basis of no evidence. I think that does have a carryover to education. Um, because a lot of schools have thought incorrectly, I think, that they had a duty. As soon as a child said something that indicated maybe they, they're really of, uh, their gender is different from their sex or they're, uh, they're not really who, who they are. Boys trapped <laughs> in a girl's body. Exactly, vice versa, exactly. Yeah. That, 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 they, that they have a duty to immediately affirm that and to start calling the child by a new name, new pronouns, allow them to wear a different uniform um, and all the rest of it. Well, that's, that is the approach that in medicine, that, that CAS is really criticising. So and, and perhaps in some cases keeping it secret from parents. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, most seriously of all, yes. So um, I think it's really helpful in, in that it, it undermines that. And it does draw schools' attention, I think, to potentially anyway, to, to, to the danger that they could be affirming a child, encouraging them down that path for which there is no evidence that it, it's beneficial. Mm-hmm. And if that child then pursues treatment, which causes permanent damage to their bodies, um, which they later regret, that, that if, if, if the school made that decision and encouraged the child down that route, then, then there may be a case against the school. Um, so uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot there that's helpful. Um, Cass also talks about the problems of children living in stealth so um, if a child, particularly before puberty, transitions and transitions in school, and as far as everyone's concerned, this girl is a boy or vice versa, mm-hmm. that child then um, is facing daily anxiety that they're going to be found out, that someone's going to find out that they're not actually, their bodies are not the gender that they believe themselves to be that they're presenting as. And that generates that generates the anxiety, but it also generates the desire for puberty blockers, mm-hmm. um, because as a child approaches puberty, they're not going to be able to hide this for very much longer. So, 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 so there is a relationship there between what's happening in schools 
where children are affirmed socially and what that has led to or what that has driven in terms of a demand for, for medical treatment. Now, of course, the, the prescription of puberty blockers has been removed, but CAS does um, raise concerns about private treatment and private prescriptions. Um, in fact, there was recently a, a court case um, in, in the family courts um, where, where uh, the court ordered that the ch a child should should no longer have any contact with That's gender right, GP yeah, yeah. that was uh, which is a, a service based abroad. So th there's still a risk of children obtaining drugs on the internet even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so so schools are still exposing children to those risks if they're putting in them in a position where where they are likely to seek those sorts of, of treatments. Um, so I think it's really helpful for schools. I think it also has changed um, the, the sort of political balance. Um, so if you, you listen to um, the debate in, in Parliament on the CAS review, the tone of that debate and who's on the back foot and who's on the front foot is completely 180 degrees turned around from how it was when, when these things have been debated in Parliament a couple of years ago. Um, and I think that is... There's less of the tr sort of transphobia accusations. Yes, that, that's, that's right. And, and it's actually the people who've been supporting all, all, all this, this affirmative approach who are, who are a bit on the back foot, um, a bit you know, cautious about what they're saying and, and maybe changing their story a little bit. Mm. Um, so. I think that's helpful to the government as well. It's an encouragement to them to get on and um, publish the final version of this guidance for schools on how to gender respond to yeah, yeah how to respond to children who are questioning their gender, um, and to not water that down. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, to strengthen it. Um, and it's very important that the government gets on and issues its new version of the relationships and sex education guidance that. Um, over a year ago now, the Prime Minister ordered the review of that to be brought forward, and now it's later than it was originally planned. Um, there's also the... Do you think it could be better for having waited for the, for the CAS review? That's possible. It, it's possible that they've waited for the CAS review because that enables them to go further, yeah. gives them the cover for that. Um, but it's important they get on with that, and that they also uh, update safeguarding guidance for schools. Um, at the moment, safeguarding guidance for schools, statutory safeguarding guidance, contains phrases that were inserted through Stonewall lobbying um, that are very unhelpful, that basically tell schools that being transgender is not a safeguarding issue. Mm -hmm. Well, what that does is it, um, it effectively exempts these children from normal safeguarding mm -hmm. because it tells schools, well, here, you, you've got this child that they're at, they're at risk of, of all sorts of things by, by going down this course, but actually it's not a safeguarding issue. Mm -hmm. Well, it is, obviously it is. So, so there, there there's, needs to be more action on the back of the CAS review to really um, take this forward in education. But I think the CAS review um, is helpful um, to the government in doing that. Okay, so let's, let, me, let me ask a very practical question and I'll, I'll start with you, John, but um, others could, could uh, add in as well because you, you're all engaged with parents to, in, in different degrees. So in the light of CAS, if, uh, if one, so you're talking to parents um, most days of the week, um, if, if a parent rings up um, one day and, and uh, asking for advice saying that uh, the school that their child attends is affirming their gender questioning child in the opposite sex. What are you, what are you gonna say um, now that perhaps you wouldn't have been able to say pre cas So there's, there's, there's quite a lot you'd want to explore with that parent in terms of what, they've, what, what interactions they've already had with the school, uh, how the school has responded to that. Um, but in terms specifically of CAS, I think what they can be saying to the school is, you're affirming my child. Do you realise there is no evidence that that is of any benefit to my child? Quote the CAS report. Mm. And in actual fact, it exposes my child potentially to these harms um, and say what those are. Um, and it's going against my wishes and I am the parent. Um, and there are there are some quite strong principles there in the law in this country that recognise that these sorts of decisions are really for parents to make, not for schools to make. Schools educate children on behalf of parents. They are in loco parentis, that they, they mm. are performing a duty of care on behalf of parents. So it's not up to the school to, to start making 
these really radical decisions. And again, I think the, the Castro view is, is helpful in, in drawing attention to just how radical some of these things are. You know, when, when a child is, um, is, is called by a different name and a different pronoun, you might say, well, like, you know, what, what significance does that have? Children have all sorts of nicknames, you know. Um, but actually, it's really significant. And, and, and what the Castro review about says, particularly for prepubertal children living in stealth, I think that that brings that point out, supports that point. OK, mm. let's take a bit of a step back. Let's move. But we've got in some detail there, which is really good. But let's sort of um, go big picture again. Um, Stephanie Davis, right, if I can just um, come to you, there's been calls for a number of calls, actually, for there to be a public inquiry um, off the back of the cast review that this that what has been going on in the NHS and schools and in society is so horrific and has been going on for so long and has left so many um, children physically and mentally scarred. There ought to be a, a, a public inquiry. Are you, are you supportive of that of that um, of that desire? I am, I am supportive, yes, as long as we also put in the fixes that are needed right now. In fact, they should have been put in before. But Rather than kicking the can down the road, catch, you mean? Yes, yeah, because a public inquiry takes time. Yeah. And normally a public inquiry happens after the problem's solved. The problem isn't solved yet. Mm -hmm. So as long as we continue to put in um, everything that we need to solve the problems that are here right now, and I think they need to be solved urgently um, and particularly in schools and and within the NHS but but then to the yes we do need a public inquiry because there is this institutional capture right across the board across society including in government and so how that happened how we allowed that to happen I'm not generally a big fan of making new laws but what I do think is that the systems that were in place to safeguard children failed. And how did they fail? We need to look at how they failed and how we can stop that from happening again. John Denning, when he was t talking, uh, referred to the change of tone in Parliament. Um, and uh, Education Secretary Gillian Keegan, uh, she's gone back on her previous view that trans women are women. women. So too Labour's West Streeting. Something of a change in tone from the Labour, le Labour leader, Sakir Starmer. Various others um, who, who had been strident previously have, have perhaps have rode back to some degree or another. Um, I'm interested um, to ask you whether you think that there is, uh, in the light of CAS, there is built up enough of a new consensus, enough of a, a new pro-reality, pro-biology, pro-safeguarding sort of momentum that that, that that would be maintained. We think there might be an election later this year or, 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 in, or early next year. Whether that momentum that's built up, if there is some, would, would see its way into whatever, whatever happens in the next election. Yeah, I hope so, and I and I think so. I think what Julie said before about the CAST report giving people confidence who didn't dare speak out before, I think it's permission given, giving, and that really after reading after that final report, you can no longer get away with calling somebody a transphobic bigot for wanting caution, for wanting proper safeguarding of children. It's clearly not about that. I mean, it never has been. It's never come from the people that I know that are speaking out. It's not coming from bigotry at all. It's coming from really genuine concerns that people are not doing their jobs to safeguard children. And so I think the CAS, I think some people were shocked by it. I think some politicians, it, I think, were taken aback by, by reading that final report. Um, I think it's strong enough to take us through it. I mean, it's never been a political issue. It's not a left or right issue. It's it, it's an issue of uh, reality versus ideology, um, child safeguarding, um, clear language, um, freedom of speech. It's, there's a lot of issues that, that, that wrapped up in it. It's not a, that's not left or right. It's, so I, I would hope, and I, and I think, that um, if a Labour government 
gets in next, um, that they would not dare to go against the cast review. I think it's strong enough, but it, but I also think there's an awful lot of work still to do to keep that at the forefront of people's minds and to really, you know, on the issue of schools, we have to use this information. The wider message here is that um, an ideology and an approach was put in without any evidence. So along with the medical experiment on children, there was a social, there has been a big social experiment on children. And that's not just the children who are identifying as transgender. It's on every child in the classroom, every child in the school. As soon as you start saying a boy that is a girl or a girl is a boy, apart from the fact that the school is practicing secrecy and deception on children um, and going against um Educate, you know, their educational obligations to teach children facts. Um, it's also a huge safeguarding issue that that you you're having you're keeping secrets about a person's sex, and so what what Cass is doing in her report is looking at the approach, which is the gender affirmative approach. Now, the gender affirmative approach doesn't start in the hormone clinic. The gender affirmative approach now all too often starts in a child's school, mm-hmm. and, we, and it, you know unless we look at the the root where what's the first step on the gender affirmative pathway, it's affirmation in schools. Mm. So, I, and even know, nurseries. We need to join the dots here and mm. and take what we can, what we learn from Cass. Everything that Cass says about puberty blockers and about cross sex hormones, all the evidence is exactly the same for. Um, social affirmation of children. And of course, this isn't just that we've we talked about the political scene there very briefly, but this isn't just about the politicians. Um, there's there's influence in, there's still influence in and significant influence in the hands of the big uh, trans lobby groups. Dr. Maxwell, John, um, do you think, would you expect there to be a greater reluctance for the big corporates, big public bodies to engage with the likes of Stonewall and mermaids and gendered intelligence and so on and so forth because of the strength of what Dr. Hilary Cass had to say? I mean, I, I would hope so. Um, I mean, we have already seen you know, some organisations pulling back from the, the sort of Stonewall diversity schemes and we've already heard about the, you know, the NHS pulling out of the, the rainbow flag scheme. Um, but I, I, I do think they still still have a significant influence, um, and I think there are, I think there are so many people within these organisations who are activists um, that I think that is, it's still going to be a, a, a long haul. I think I think you mentioned you know, kind of you know one step forward, two steps back, mm-hmm. and, and I think because they are under pressure and under fire, I suppose from the evidence from the Cast Review, they are shouting louder. Um, and they, you know, so, you know, they're trying to discredit Cass. Yeah, there's and, a lot know, of opposition to there's Cass. There's a lot there? of opposition. You know, she's she's been getting, you know, abuse online. Um, you know, and, and there is this constant uh, pressure. You know, there are websites and all sorts of things who, you know, exist to list people like Stephanie and myself and all sorts of other people as transphobic. But, you know, and that still exists. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I think... It is still a, it's still going to be an uphill battle. I think it's you know the tide is turning, but it we, we mustn't rest on our laurels. I don't think. Do you agree, John? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think you know it, that that's it's also a mistake to think oh this is all the government's job. Mm-hmm. I mean yes, it is the government's job, mm-hmm. um, but what is needed is people to speak up mm-hmm. wherever they are, um, and 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 to not let these organisations and these influences get away with stating things as fact mm-hmm. that are not fact. Mm-hmm. Um, and to be prepared to challenge it wisely and graciously, not 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 in not in a not in a unnecessarily sort of oppositional shouty sure, way, yeah. but in a way that that has an impact. Mm. Um, and that's, I mean, my particular area of schools. That's very true in schools. Um, we 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 are expecting at some point this this new guidance on relationships, sex, and health education for schools in England. Um, when that comes out, schools will have to revisit their own policies, and the law says that schools must consult parents when they re- when they write or revise their RSE policy. So there is an opportunity for parents yeah. to speak out and to really make sure that the schools schools are not 
promoting gender ideology. Mm-hmm. And they can leverage CAS. To, and they can leverage CAS for that, yeah. Uh, Dr. Maxwell, the uh, CAS isn't the only authority that's out there. Um, it might be the most thoroughly researched one, um, perhaps, but there's, there's no doubt that there's other advice out there which um, people who are wedded to the affirmation model would choose to point to. Now, the sort of standout in my mind for that is um, the, the WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. D- do you think we're do you think we're entering a sort of cast free WPATH kind of world? I, th- I think we've probably been in it for a while. In, in that, obviously, the cast free has been going on for a while. We had the interim report, um, and, and but I, th- I think the the, the sort of the, the misunderstanding many people have is that something like WPATH is the expert and, and actually really it's just a group of predominantly activists you know and, and Cass kind of points out that the, a lot of the guidelines that WPATH and, and all the various other guidelines that are out there it's all very circular they just refer to each other and you kind of go around and around in circles and that a lot of the uh, studies that they cite in their guidelines were were not included in the CAS review because they were of such poor quality mm-hmm. so CAS review has only included the 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 studies that are of good quality. Yeah, it's just I suppose it's just worth briefly making the point that there was a there was a lot of fuss made from from various people about uh, um, CAS not having included a load of studies, Study. but 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 the reason it didn't include the studies is because they weren't of sufficient quality. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think uh, I, I think I'm right in saying that and Dawn Butler sort of referred to this. Stonewall had put out something on, about not including these studies, and then she had to. Backtrack, backtrack and, yeah, uh, yeah. on that, but she wasn't the only one to she no. wasn't the only one to do that, and that's still sort of out there as a kind of a it's discredited because yes. it didn't include studies so, which weren't worth including. No, essentially, yeah, absolutely, yeah. and I, and I, but I also think another aspect to this is actually for for particularly I think for the young people themselves, they're not interested in the cast review or WPATH for for that matter. They're interested in what the latest YouTuber says. So actually, for, I think for a lot of the young people involved in this, you know, this isn't a, actually about guidelines or evidence. This is what about, about what they're being told mm-hmm. online, which is which is another aspect that's important for us to consider. Um, but the the guidelines and the cast review and, and what we do with what the young people s- see and hear is our responsibility. Um, but yeah, I think that's another aspect we have to be aware of. Okay, um, Stephanie Davis and I, I'd like to give. Perhaps the final word to you. We'll, we'll see if uh, see if John, Doctor Maxwell, want to come back in on this. Um, we've we've touched on it at various points. I think we mentioned it right near the start. Actually, um, uh, I described it as a very good start. We've talked about there's there's lots of good things that are in there. Um, did it fall short anywhere in your mind? Um, would be I suppose my first question, and and if it did. What do you see as being the next step that needs to happen to either build upon CAS or really make CAS work? Um, well, to start off with, she's well, Hillary CAS has produced the most comprehensive, thorough, systematic review um, and guide um, in the world. And it's, it's a huge, huge achievement. We should feel very proud that that has come out of the UK. What it's exposed is that, um, you know, normal standards of evidence have not, have not existed before. That's the, that's the scandal. I wouldn't pick up, I mean, I, I, you know, as I said before, a lot of people have picked up some ideological language within it. But again, I think there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, I think that the information um, that's, put out in a very, very measured, factual way, speaks for itself. It's how we interpret it now, and that's going to be key. I don't think there are any failings in the report. I don't think Kaus could have gone further into the issue of schools, for example, because it's outside her remit, sure, absolutely, yeah. and she's not a teacher, she's not an, an educator. But I would really like... Um, people to start from that um, that report as irrefutable evidence that this system and this approach has really failed children in the worst possible way. It's caused terrible harms and lifelong harms 
many young people. And so it, it's, a, it's a really sobering report, and it should make people angry. Mm. And I hope that um, the people will join the dots and now do the same in education, now look at the wider issues that I'm really glad Cass brought up, the cultural, social issues, the influences on young people like smartphones and pornography, for example, and the internet, and how hard it is to grow up in today's society, how the challenges are really unique for this generation. And so I, I hope, um, yeah, and, and, and possibly if I'm going to pick at anything, I wish she'd gone further into that. That's, that's I think, is absolutely key um, in, in this subject, but I'm really glad that she, she, you know, she brought it up. I think we probably need a report from a sociologist or somebody to, to, to really sort of flesh out all of the details of the culture that this generation's growing up in. Um, but I'm very glad that, that, that Cass introduced that aspect of it. And now we need to look at, at this issue on a, you know, much more widely. John Denning, Judy Maxwell, do you want to add anything to that? Um, it talks about only giving puberty blockers as part of a research protocol. I think my, my personal view is that to go back now and do a research on that would be ethically very, very difficult to do, yeah, yeah. given the evidence that we do already have. But I understand why she's kind of left the door open uh, to, to kind of like say, because it, it, this is a medical evidence document and we have to say, these are possibilities. We don't know. We don't have the evidence. Yeah. So I don't think she's saying, yes, that is. Um, it's a medical document. It, it's not an ideological document, it's not, even if it even if it's would say things yeah. that we so would while, wish it to say. While we would like it <clears throat> to go further, that's not what the CAS review mm. is about. It's no, about the medical awful. evidence. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just agree, I agree with Stephanie, really. It's, I mean, the first thing I read and when I saw the CAS, when the CAS report was released was the chapter on social transition, because that's what I was particularly interested in from schools. And I, I wanted it to say more than it did say. Um, but it is really just a case of, of following the dots, seeing where the CAS review has, has taken us and, and then extending that further and, mm -hmm. and, and thinking about... Um, how this works in the social situation of the school, thinking about what schools teach, as well as thinking about the school's treatment and response to, to individual children. Um, you know, I was talking to someone who works in a school um, with four-year-olds, and there was a child in the class who the parents say that they're, they're, they're a girl when they're actually a boy. Um, and she's being asked then if, 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 if she's on, on lunch duty or something and the child falls over, this child falls over in the playground, you know, scrapes any or something, she then has to talk about this child, but she doesn't, she, she feels if, if she was to use the pronouns and the name she's being asked to use, she's communicating a very, very powerful message to all those other four-year-olds who are just learning about the difference between, between boys and girls to then start referring to this child as if they're a different sex from what they really are. It's, it's lying to children and, and teachers, you know, if we say that medics should first do no harm, teachers should first tell no lies, you know, schools should be about the pursuit of truth. And I mean, schools can't always get everything right. Teachers can't always get everything right. But at the very least, children and their parents should have confidence that that is, that's what the school is about, that, that, that teachers are attempting to educate children in truths about the world, not trying to mislead them. OK, well, uh, John Denning, CI's own head of education, Dr Julie Maxwell and Stephanie Davis Arai, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you for making such a complex topic um, so understandable and, and, and doing it so concisely. Uh, it's, this is gonna, discussion is going to be a real help uh, to our supporters and no doubt uh, many others as well. Thank you all very much indeed. For more great content, like, subscribe and hit the notification bell.